And it's my honor uh, to have the opportunity today to introduce our keynote speaker, Eileen Marti. Dr. Marti is a practicing physician and a physician scientist with decades of clinical uh, and research experience. She has more than 45 years of research experience. Beginning in 1976 with work on vision studies in the lemon shark and spans sizable clinical research studies in, involving helminthic infections and drug interactions. You're testing me. <laughs> Clinic pathological studies and the health impact of vaccines on humans, rodents, epidemiological and laboratory studies on disease, including leprosy in non-human human primates, and heavy contributions to studies on the pathogenesis of Ebola virus and on non-human primates. Disease surveillance in the public health and impact disease and including legal, medical, and sociological factors. Uh, Dr. Marti has practiced clinical medicine, mainly trop tropical medicine in many nations of the Americas, Africa, and Asia. She is one of eight individuals on the Blue Ribbon Panel that created Military Tropical Medicine Course. The tropical medicine program she helped devise included multiple annual med-ready operations worldwide. These operations bring medical teams of physicians training in tropical medicine to low and middle income nations where they organize and provide care on ships and at land-based rapidly developed medical sites to hundreds of patients per day. Uh, Dr. Marti has served on multiple national, regional, international boards, helping the World Health Organization with mass gathering med medicine, with the health security interface, working for the United Nations as a weapons inspector, and working with the White House for the National Security Council and as a pre presidential advisor. She has helped manage multiple outbreaks and pandemics for the military, national, and international organizations, including the 1993 M Milwaukee cryptosporidiosis outbreak, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, and more recently, the 2009 H1N1 Ebola, Zika, and Mpox outbreaks. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Marti became the laboratory director and consulting, uh, clinical consultant for the high complexity laboratory at FIU. Capable of diagnosing COVID-19, she has treated Countless COVID-19 patients helped the country and state and the nation in dealing with the pandemic by providing counseling for the mayor, the courts, the schools, jails, and businesses to help them navigate best practices. She is sought after by local, national, international media to discuss and explain medicine and science developments and provide expert and thoughtful information and concepts for strategic planning. Dr. Marti is also the co-editor of the Elsevier journal One Health. Today, she is here to present, yeah, Preparing for a Pandemic X, a Wicked One Health Problem, and to discuss the need for a multidisciplinary approach to find workable solutions to future emergencies. So please, help me welcome and thank Dr. Marti for joining us here. Thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for that amazing pre uh, introduction. And it's such a privilege and an honor to be here. I've had an opportunity to meet quite a few of you and learn your backgrounds and research interests. And it's just, it's just a fascinating group. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, can you hear me well if I stand back a little bit? OK, because I may have to go over there and make sure that <laughs> everything works. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about pandemics. Of course, I have nothing to disclose. I have a, a rather uh, ambitious set of slides, but I think, I think we can go through and gather the knowledge that we need uh, from this. And uh, I'm showing you these two images here. One is a Petri dish made from nasty organisms, uh, made to look in a beautiful way. And I want to remind you, that microorganisms are micro-predators. They are part of the planet. They're here with us. They were here before we were here. And they can look lovely under the microscope. Um, <clears throat> and then we have to think in terms, when we're thinking of One Health issues, such as climate change and obviously the climate, we have to go to the macro environment as well. So I'll be focusing from both levels. And I'll just want to take you back in time to when our world was formed and, uh, and make the point that 
life forms have altered the planet from the get-go. And some very interesting studies uh, <clears throat> done on uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer, which, by the way, is an Illinois uh, Urbana concept that, uh, that was brought to the world. Congratulations on that. Uh, has estimated that archaea were already, which again is an organism, uh, or a set of organisms rather, that were discovered here in Urbana. Congratulations on that as well. Um, <clears throat> that they were here at least uh, three, three and a half billion years ago, altering the climate and in a way that allowed us to survive on this planet. Moreover, in terms of pandemics and health, I just want to remind you that we have always, or at least as long as Hippocrates, recognized the fact that the environment alters health. And so Hippocrates made that point, uh, 400 BCE, that we have to pay attention to the environment that someone is in when we want to consider their health status. I also want to make the point that data, as it is often presented, can be deliberately misleading. So the chart that you're seeing here is different from the one that you saw earlier because it spans hundreds of millions of years. And this is the one that's, um, I actually have the, a photograph of the original, but this one is an easier to read version. This is sitting at the Natural History Museum in the Smithsonian. And this particular display of heating patterns on Earth was paid for by David Koch uh, and Congress. And I will say nothing more about what that signifies. But what I will say is data, as it's presented, can be misleading. And so it is very critical to pay attention to, what, to the fact that what we hear may be truthful, but misleading, OK? Now, in the chart that they have in uh, the Smithsonian, they show a little human origins right here. So that little dot, that little one little place where humanity first arose, uh, well, let's take a look historically and say that Homo erectus was around maybe at most three million years ago, which then evolved into Homo heidelbergensis, and of course our cousins, the uh, Neanderthals and the Devisonians, which contributed to our DNA, we've been around for about a quarter of a million years. All of that is in that one little tiny dot, I might add, okay? And then if you then consider a little part of that little tiny dot and take it and expand it to about 100,000 years and go back to comments made earlier by the wonderful speakers you had before, and look on the far right-hand side at about 10,000 years ago, you'll realize that that 10,000 years is about the span of known human history, right? So that points out that when the Earth was warmer, there were no apes, let alone humans. And when the Earth was cooler and less stable, there was no civilization. So how data is presented is really, really, really critical, OK? Now, bearing that in mind, I will again say something else that has been said before, and that is that we can divide the heat risk, and I believe it was Jeff that did this before, in terms, excuse me, not heat risk, climate change risk, into direct health impacts, indirect health impacts, and of course, geopolitical and economic health impacts. Indir very indirect health impacts that include stress, mental health issues, et cetera. And I highlighted communicable diseases, but what I really want to tell you is that, in fact, while all these different types of climate changes are happening, and I'll let the thing populate itself, there is an interrelated aspect to all of this such that, ultimately, Every single one of these things, directly or indirectly, leads to increased or changed risks for pandemics. Because if we change our uh, susceptibility to, say, allergies and asthma, that also alters our susceptibility to infection as an example, or changes to diabetes, or the heat stress continuous with inappropriate rehydration that leads to renal diseases as one of the complications of climate change, in turn, has susceptibility impact in terms of pandemic diseases, okay? So one of the ways that we think about pandemics and the usual way is to, fo and, and even pandemics and climate change, is to focus on us. But it is not 
sufficient to focus on us because it's not just how will climate change alter the pathogens that can infect humans, but it's also how does climate change alter the pathogens that affect tomatoes, that affect uh, other crops, that affect w uh, our livestock, that affect wildlife. Moreover, these stressors and factors and these temperature changes that we're experiencing, humidity changes, et cetera, also alter microbes. And they even alter the microbes of microbes. So think about how many different types of phages there are that affect bacteria. How does the climate change impact them so that changes happen to the bacteria that can then affect us, okay? And so, that's why I like to look at this not just in terms of when we think of One Health, not just in terms, and climate change, not just in terms of the macro environment, but the micro environment. What are we doing from the perspective of that human cell in our body, in our liver, in our gut, in our brain, and the microbes that are part of our microbiome, how are they being impacted by these changes. You actually have to take it to that level of communication and recognize that each of these micro changes alters which genes are being expressed. So you know that, for example, if you have uh, a dish of pseudomonas, the bacteria in one part of the dish may, even though they came from one clone, may well be expressing different, in fact, they do express different genes, have a different phenotype when they're in different parts of that same agar plate. And that's because of the microenvironment of that plate. And the same is true for us and our bodies and our cells and that of all the creatures here. And so, as a, uh, editor for infectious disease, one of my goals is to find in papers that are submitted those nodal points that keep the systems in balance. All right? <clears throat> and so this is going to absolutely require exactly what you're doing here, which is this interdisciplinary perspective, collaborations, and actions. And in terms of thinking about how these different things impact on the risks for pandemics, we have been doing this for decades. I remember a meeting that we had in Fort Detrick back in 1998 where we came up with this concept of severity and impact because we have to consider where we're going to put our dollars since there's so much to consider. Which things do we have to focus on so we get the most bang for our buck? But the problem with this, even though it's absolutely accurate, is that all of these factors are in constant shift. And those shifts invo involve the in big environmental shifts, but also technological shifts, as we've been speaking about this morning, and resilience as we alter our levels of resilience. I think Pamela very rightly brought out the conversation of, well, if we predict that there's going to be this horrible outbreak and everybody stays home, the horrible outbreak doesn't happen. That's absolutely right. So how do we change these factors in a way that works? And when we look at all these details, and one of the things, again, has been brought out here is we've talked, um, um, we talked about nutritional deficits because of not just the quantity of the food that's around, but also the change to the soil that alters the nutritional value of those particular plants and animals, right? And how is that in turn going to alter the pathogenic potential of uh, potential pathogens? And this is why I called it a witch's cauldron of complexity. This is, in fact, the classic wicked problem. So then let's talk about public health emergency of international concern, because I think most people here are sophisticated and know that the term pandemic uh, is not a term of legal art in the world, and the World Health Organization was never instructed in any way by its member states to talk about calling COVID a pandemic. That happened for political pressure. The only legal obligation of the World Health Organization was to call it or not call it a public health emergency of international concern, which it did in 30 January 2020. The, fr the fact that so many nation states chose not to recognize what that meant was a huge issue. And one of the reasons that they, in March, finally said, okay, it's a pandemic. Now, 
there, I remember operating under the International Health Regulations of 1969, which was a very lovely attempt to try and get international cooperation for big outbreak events. But they really only focused on three pathogens, the ones that were best known then. When we shifted over to the International Health Regulations of 2005, which were approved in 2007, we moved from the concept of the three different events to all public health threats from, uh, and from bo simple border control to actually infection and containment at the source, right? And the, and the concept now was to act now before it becomes so critical that it causes massive health, psychological, physiological, economic and social problems. The world chose not to do that for COVID, even though it had been declared a public health emergency at that time. But going back to the actual public health emergency of international concern nomenclature and what WHA was trying to do in 2005, it was to try and bring attention to a problem at the level of early detection. So that's the goal of the IHR. But the goal in One Health is to go even deeper, to try and keep the outbreak from happening at all, to ca try and manage the spill before it actually does spill, which is one of the reasons I asked Kevin the question that I did earlier regarding stress factors and land, and land use, okay? So we know there's gonna be more pandemics. We've been talking about it all morning. We talked about it yesterday evening and we, we use this concept that uh, Michelle Hooker did in her uh, Gray Rhino. I don't know if anyone here has read that very brilliant book, but she says, we know that these are coming and we know we need to prepare, but we're not necessarily doing it, okay? And then I bring you to something I learned in War College, and that is the wonderful work of Sun Tzu. And you go, what a minute? <laughs> Why are you talking about war college? And that's because so much that Sun Tzu wrote is actually relevant to many, many different disciplines. And one of his things is, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither, the enemy or yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So let's take a look at this pandemic climate change from Sun Tzu's perspective, and that's what I'm gonna provide for you right here, which I consider an impossible triangle of how everything is meshed together, right? So we have the environment, and we have how temperature flux uh, change things, how that alters the pathogen, and it even alters the mechanism of entry for the pathogen. We can look at changes in the pathogen itself, mutational changes, epigenetic changes, the, uh, which, uh, what specifically that pathogen is, is displaying, for example, Yersinia pestis is a bacterium that if you acquire it from the bite of a flea, you're, you're gonna get bubonic plague, right? If, however, my bubonic plague turned septic and that seeded my lungs and I'm now coughing it out at you, you're, and now you're gonna get mnemonic plague. And those bacteria in my lungs from Yersinia pestis are are having a different phylogenetic expression than, they, than the same bacterium did when it got into my body via that flea. So your odds of coming down with pneumonic plague are far higher because you were exposed this way from my respiratory secretions than it, and dying if you didn't have treatment than if you had gotten it from a flea. So, the microenvironment and the phylogenetic expression of organisms is really important. So what's the last part of this impossible triangle? And that's the host, all right? What are those host factors, age, the resilience enhancers and detractors? Do you sleep well every night? Do you eat well? Do you have an underlying condition? All of those, do you exercise? All of those things are resilience changers 
In addition, what have we been exposed to before that alters how our immune system handles the next thing that does or doesn't look similar to that? And of course, our basic genetic background because we are different and that difference is a good thing for the species if it might not be good for me. Because how my HLA B12 might handle a particular peptide for demonstration to a T cell is not necessarily the same as your HLA B44 handles that peptide and therefore the end result is different, okay? So all these individual factors that we are born with which allow for the fact that virtually every infectious disease, and Louis was so kind, he mentioned my work with leprosy. I still love leprosy. It's one of the most interesting diseases in the world. And it taught me this. First and foremost, that all infectious diseases are a spectrum, a spectrum, and it varies with these factors that we're talking about, right? So these inherited and acquired changes to how our cells function are critical to disease, right? And you also have to consider, believe it or not, the immune system of the vector and the immune system of the pathogen and how that is being altered by climactic changes, okay? So how does climate influence each of these? Let's take these one by one. We'll start with the environment. And I'll point out this beautiful paper by Carlos Mora where he talks about, uh, he does a very thorough analysis of known pathogens. And you can see that he's, he's looked at a variety of different climate change issues and then shown which ones are in going to be enhancing viruses, bacteria. Animals, of course, he means things like mites, like scabies or uh, worms, right, et cetera, all those sorts of things, fungi, protozoans, et cetera. And he, the determination is a brilliant work is that more than half of those horrible things that we know cause human diseases are enhanced by the climactic changes that we're seeing on the earth. Now, 9% nine, 9 actually have gone down. But 58% go up, that's a big, big deal, okay? And thanks to Felicity's talk yesterday, I decided to toss in a couple of extra slides. So one of them is this one, which is just to show a difference in two different uh, of the thousands of mosquitoes that were mentioned. I, we had an entomologist speaking, I know you'll uh, love this. And that is that at different temperatures, the amount of time that it takes a mosquito, particular species, to go from egg to, through various stages of larva to pupa to adult shifts. So as the temperature rises, for example, in this over here, 80s uh, vexens, we go from uh, at temperatures between 15 to 20, at 21 to 23 days, but you get a temperature of 30, it takes six to seven days. So how many more adults are you gonna have if you raise the temperature, right? And so raising temperature can have a real impact on the simple quantity of mosquitoes out there. And similarly, the pathogens that they have within them grow at different rates depending on the temperature. This is old data, but it's good data and it's very, very well validated. And so if you have more mosquitoes and each mosquito has a higher total quantity of viral particles, then when that mosquito bites you, the odds of you getting sick are that much higher because there's always what we call an infectious dose. Okay, so this leads me to the conversation of spillovers and how we have to think in terms of climate change being involved with uh, the fact that most of the pathogens that can cause public health emergency of international concern result from spillover events. And depending on which study you look at, it's somewhere between 60 and 78 percent of the emerging diseases are arising from spillover events, right? So let's look at what is it that, that, what does that have to do with climate change? Well, climate, uh, climatic hazards cause habitat changes, as we've been talking about, that bring pathogens closer to people. 
um, especially by bringing vectors closer to people. And Kevin mentioned that when he talked a little bit about uh, having uh, uh, more forest areas within urban areas. Now you have more ticks, so now you have more Lyme disease, right? So these sorts of changes, when you bring the, the vector closer together, can increase your hazard. And climate hazards also bring um, pathogens, um, uh, bring people closer to pathogens because the climactic changes can drive people into land use and water changes that increase risk, and then, of course, climate change can enhance the virulence of pathogens and decrease the resilience of the host, what I've been mentioning to you earlier. So there are a number of different uh, ways to look at the various aspects of how these things are affected at a micro and macro environmental levels. And all of these will impact the elements that determine that basic reproductive number that Jeff was talking about in his talk, okay? Um, when he was alluding to um, getting the, uh, the, the RO, right, the R0, which involves the duration of the infectious period, the opportunity, the transmission probability, and the susceptibility potential that we've been talking about. So when you take all those things into consideration, you realize that there are going to be mutational changes because of these climactic effects. And whether or, no, or not those mutational changes and or epigenetic changes lead to a new pathogen is going to happen if there is adaptation. So if adaptation is possible and, acceptable and accessible, then it's going to happen because life wants to survive, uh, just like um, that actor said on Jurassic Park, life finds a way, right? So genetic alterations are random, we know this, they're completely random, but they are based on what's in the environment that drives the mutational change, and that's the microenvironment that we're talking about, right? So these adaptive changes are driven by constant competing and cooperative micro and then macro events, okay? Now, it's gonna be other microbes in the microenvironment that also will then be impacted and may exchange pathogenic determinants. So another level of complication is the horizontal gene transfer that happens not infrequently among bacteria, right? And so this particular pathogen adapted to that area develops a pathogenicity island that it now shares with other pathogens, right? And this is not new, this concept that a microenvironment is going to lead to these types of changes, but it's new that we understand it, right? So if you go way back in time to Louis Pasteur and Louis Thule, when they were doing experiments trying to make vaccines, even before they even understood, they, they had no idea what a virus was, right? That, that was not a real concept at that time, and they were just barely understanding what bacteria were, but they did find that passage of certain bacteria through pigeons made pathogens more aggressive, whereas path if you pass it to, through a different animal, it can attenuate it and then be useful as an attenuated vaccine. And then that combinations of these things can lead to an optimal vaccine strategy. So again, I want to remind you that we are part of this earth and that viruses, bacteria, fungi, and other pathogens are part of the circle of life. That's why I call these little things micropredators and that they were in fact here first and that these concepts of diversity of viruses are really intricate to how we have to view the issue of climate change. So if you then wanna say, well, which ones are we gonna put our money on and how are we gonna think about this? Um, everybody's seen a variety of different types of these uh, trees. They can be very complicated, and of course, if you add the concept of horizontal gene transfer, it becomes a big mess uh, because of this transfer of genetic factors to these things. But I think that overall, right now, there's about 1,400 pathogens that we really ought to worry about that can cause significant human disease and be transmissible enough and at a rate of death that is significant enough to have another problem like we did with COVID.
So among them, the most serious, of course, and the most likely, of course, are viruses, not only because of their enormous numbers and variety, uh, but, but also because, especially the RNA viruses, most of which do not do proofreading, the odds of a, uh, a uh, random mutation leading to a pathogenic uh, advantage in humans is highest in those states. But historically, we've had a lot of bacterial agents that have caused big plagues. And, uh, and of course, we do have another problem, and that is that of some vaccines that are losing their efficacy because they were developed a long time ago and they just don't work anymore. And then, of course, the bigger problem in terms of bacteria, which is the issue of antimicrobial resistance resistance, which is particularly poignant right now for staph and E. coli, which can certainly be a problem. And I want to remind you that in 2019, about somewhere between 3.6 and 6.7 million deaths were attributable to bacterial antimicrobial resistance. So that has to be in the mix of the problems. In terms of fungal agents, uh, I, I showed you an image of a fungus before, but I didn't mention uh, Canada auris, and Canada auris has become a huge problem. Canada auris has become a huge problem because it was basically a saprophyte that only rarely caused human disease, but as but there is a lot of data that suggests, it's not totally 100 percent, but there's a lot of data that suggests that the climactic changes pushed Canada auris to adapt to warmer temperatures. One of the big reasons that we're not constantly having a lot of fungal infections is that for most fungi, we're too dang hot, okay? But when the planet becomes warmer and the agents that are normally saprophytic adapt to the warmer temperatures, our body temperature is not that foreign anymore. And Canada auris is a fungus with tremendous amount of resistance to our best antifungal agents. So we're looking at that hard and fast. All right, let's go back to the viruses. I think one of the most clever things that was done in recent years was done by um, Barney Graham and Nancy Sullivan, where they were looking at these same problems that we're talking about, and they decided to group the viruses into their mechanisms of entry. So they put in uh, four groups, uh, three for envelope viruses and one for the non-envelope viruses in terms of their mechanisms of entries, and then found prototypes within those to start developing medical countermeasures, including both vaccine development and uh, treatment developments, okay? And they, a tremendous amount of work was done on this by them and by many others trying to develop vaccines for these prototypes. And thank goodness they did that because there was a prototype vaccine for MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, which is a coronavirus, which is a kissing cousin of SARS-CoV-2, so that when the Chinese published the genome, they were able to use that genome to basically alter what they had already done for MERS. And that's one of the key reasons that we had messenger RNA vaccines so rapidly. So this, this was a way of prepare for these things. Now, it is true that pathogen X, whatever it may be, could be something new and have a completely different mechanism of entry, but that's actually unlikely. I want to just quickly mention some of the recent outbreaks that we've all been involved with. I just want to mention HIV because that was my biggest thing back when I was a young medical student. And I, I can remember very well Dr. Saldanas calling me down. I was, uh, you know, working at a lab and he says, oh, you must come. It was like 1979. Come down. You're going to see this patient. You'll never see anything like this. He has a protozoan, they didn't know it was a fungus, um, called pneumocystis carini in his lungs. And he was a homosexual. And he has all these lesions in his anogenital ano area. You must come. So we go down to the morgue, and he picks up these lungs uh, with his bare hands, because that's what we did back then, right, and hands it to me with my bare hands 
to feel this. So when I think about lessons learned, I never forget. <laughs> and I wonder why I'm still around, <laughs> considering the exposures that I've had. So um, we learned so much from HIV, and in fact, a lot of the work that Barney Graham and Nancy Sullivan did was because of the money for advocacy that came in for HIV that stood up the institutes that, uh, that did this sort of research. So we did learn a tremendous amount of immunology that has helped not only infectious disease, but also cancer and autoimmune disease and autoinflammatory diseases, which are related issues. But what does all this have to do with climate change? Well. As far as HIV AIDS, we know that temperature, sea level, greenhouse gases, and extreme weather will and do impact the increased prevalence of other infectious diseases that negatively impact people with HIV AIDS, and it increases food insecurity, which also negatively impacts anybody with already an underlying condition, and it spurs human migration and the erosion of public health infrastructure, as well as, obviously, that's going to include HIV prevention and treatment services. So HIV is facing a crisis because of climate change. Ebola. So I had the privilege of uh, working with Ebola, both with non-human primates and with humans out in West Africa. During the big outbreak, I um, saw a lot of Ebola patients. And mind you, I definitely wore PPE for that. Um, but Ebola is, is something with a long incubation period. And one of the things, since I had been working in Africa since 1985, by the time this outbreak happened in 2014, the big West African outbreak in 2014, 2015, 2016 time frame, uh, there's a lot of changes in Africa. And one of the biggest changes that I'd seen over the decades was the increase in wonderful infrastructure. Fantastic. But what does that do when you have a 21-day incubation period? It facilitates the transport of pathogens that are going from point A to point B while that individual has absolutely no idea that they're sick with something, okay? So th these are among the many things that I learned there. But in terms of climate change and filoviruses diseases in general, not just Ebola, but, you know, uh, Mar Marburg as well, we know that changes in migration and movement of these, of these uh, filovirus hosts and changes in land use and behavior are going to directly increase the risk of these filovirus infections. All right, MPOX. MPOX, MPOX uh, goes back to the equity issue as well, because, and it goes back to some of the other things we've been discussing, which is public health trust. Right, because uh, if you look at some of the problems that we had with MPOX, one of the things that once again happened in the United States, which I find just so sad and so unnecessary, with, despite our wealth and our scientific acumen and our research power, brilliant people like the ones in this room, we still wound up with more cases than any other country and more deaths so out of the 110 deaths that there have been as of April 22nd, 42 of them were here in the United States, okay? So we're, not, we're doing something wrong in how, despite how smart we are and how clever we are and how good our science is, we're not communicating what we need to communicate. And climate change is also involved here because the spread of this particular pathogen was also influenced by ecological disruptions, land use, and importantly, public health inequity. Okay? Let's move on to COVID-19. And I know everyone in this room has their own fantastic stories to tell about COVID, so I'm not going to uh, try and say that you know my stories are any better than your stories, but they are. They are all stories that we have experienced that are part of what the pandemic has done to us. And we have uh, you know, some challenges. And one of the things is that we saw this coming. It was on our list, OK? We knew SARS was a likely time bomb ready to explode and become a pandemic since at least 2007, when we recognized how many SARS viruses there are in bats, okay? And we really didn't prepare for it the way we should have. So we need to change that. Now, 
we were able to get a lot of things up and running because of the work that had been done before, and we did revolutionize clinical trials for these vaccines. In part, we could do it because there were enough cases, so it was pretty easy to get enough uh, people with and without vaccines to do that sort of study. But what I want to point out is something interesting, and it's, it's controversial, and that's about the origin of the uh, Omicron variant. So in terms of the, or the origin, there have been three prevailing hypotheses, and that is that it happened because of cryptic spread. It was happening, it was changing, we just didn't pay attention. Another, that it evolved chronically in an infected COVID-19 patient. And last but not least, that it accumulated mutations in a non-human host. Now here's the thing, de novo mutations in RNA virus genomes, uh, that happens, yes, it's somewhat random, but not totally random, because it does depend on those microenvironments, and the types of mutation are exquisitely sensitive to the microenvironments. So if you look at local host microenvironments and the specific changes that happened and were seen in Omicron when it appeared in humans, we come to the realization that most of those changes benefit a virus's that were growing in a rodent. And so this argues very strongly if you take into consideration the importance of the microenvironment in evolutionary change of pathogens, that it is most likely that Omicron spilled back from humans to mice during the pandemic, most likely in mid-2020, and then accumulated mutations in that mouse host before jumping back to humans. And that's why we saw so many mutations that were ready to go, and we had that other huge spike, okay? And if you, t you, you, you can accept that, you should also accept this concept of the multi-directional, multi-host passage mechanisms that lead to new pathogens because things spill back and forth and are affected by each and everything in the environment. And we have to recognize that intermediate hosts can serve as mixing vessels and introduce re, uh, new recombinants. We certainly saw that with the uh, H1N1 2009 influenza pandemic, right? There are increased opportunities for, in, uh, for encounters that enhance the odds of the formation of successful new combinations. And the fact that there are these life cycle complex of pathogens that actually bring a lot of potential nodal points for change in these organisms. So genetic, immunologic, and metabolic features of organisms will then, in turn, alter the risk for these spillovers. All right, so we've talked about the environment. We've talked about the pathogens themselves. Let's talk a little bit about immunology. My love, I love immunology. It's such a cool field. And, and one of the things that I, uh, you know, and it's true of physiology in general, not just immunology, but, you know, to come here, I had to pack, right? And I'm not gonna pack every possible combination of outfits. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be smart about it. And the bodies and our cells and microbial cells are smart too. They use combined methods of creating whatever they need. So they'll use the same molecule uh, more than once and form a different receptor, for example, okay? And that's actually been very useful in translational medicine to develop drugs that can attack more than one thing because we know which component will affect more than one, okay? So as you think about it that way and you think about the ways that we now recognize that immunology is an integration, this old idea of there's an innate and adaptive immune system is so out of date because they are constantly interacting. There is a constant interaction. The adaptive system cannot develop if the innate system doesn't wake it up. And the uh, adaptive system works mainly by instructing the innate system how to do its job in a way that's effective. So when we think about how all of these factors are affecting the outcome, we also have come to this notion now of type 1, type 2, and type 17, or type 3 immunity. And when you think about type 1, type 2, and type 3 immunity, and the veterinarians in the audience will appreciate this particularly, we knew for a long time that feline infectious um, uh, virus, uh, coronavirus, uh, would be very devastating to cats 
who went with type 2 immunity, and not so devastating if they in instead responded to the same coronavirus with type 1 immunity. When we, what we saw with SARS-CoV-2 was the same thing in humans. So humans whose immune system went with a type 1 response had either no symptoms whatsoever, right, or mild symptoms and got over it quickly. But those who responded because of a variety of different reasons, including previous exposure with type 2 immunity, ended up in the ICU or dead. So one of the big things that we've done with vaccines is to drive the population towards type 1 immunity, which is why I'm not wearing a mask today. I've had my vaccine six times, and I'm, I'm pretty secure that I have good type 1 immunity ready to go against SARS-CoV-2, okay? And when we developed the messenger RNA vaccines, one of the interesting things that we'll note is right here, this, oops, sorry about that. I didn't mean that to happen, this. We drove towards type 1 immunity. It does it, and it does it in a brilliant way. And it does it because when we make that particular spike, intracellularly after the lipid nanoparticle gets into the cells, it's not just processed by ubiquitization and proteasomes that's going to expose it to CD8 cytotoxic T cells. Some of it, some of that spike is going to be autophagocytosed, enter lysosomes, and be presented with MHC class 2 to helper cells. And some of that spike escapes the cells and can, in some rare individuals, cause myocarditis, but for most of us, what it does is it allows our mature but naive B cells to, to be exposed to the spike, to then, in, to then encounter CD4 cells that can interact with those newly exposed B cells, and then produce the appropriate antibodies in type 1 immunity that we need for a successful outcome. And that's why there's a huge difference between getting your protection from a vaccine versus randomly exposing people as some advocated to the wild virus. Because when you're exposed to the wild virus, the immune system is making random combinations, random combinations of clones in the hopes, you know, it's throwing the kitchen sink at it, okay, in the hopes of being able to reduce the infection. And when you do that, some of the immunity that you produce is not only not effective, it's also potentially harmful. And that leads to the big issues of long COVID, which, of course, there's also such a thing as long flu and long Ebola and yada yada, long what have you, because of these types of interactions between the host, the pathogens, uh, you know, and the host immune system specifically. So, that's another concept I wanted to lay at you and remind you of the very many ways in which these antibodies work once they're formed and, and why some of them don't work. And then I leave you with this, what are we going to do now if we have all these things to consider? Again, how do we focus? Where do we look for the next fight, uh, Public Health Emergency of International Concern. We look, of course, for animal sources and those animal encounters. We look for host range. We look for the modes of transmission, genome segmentation, recombination frequency, duration of the infection, and then the mortality and lethality of the agent as to decide what we have to do. But of course, the devil's in the details, as it always is, and we have to look at those details. So in terms of action areas right now, we really should think in terms of having those MOUs in place that are going to facilitate managing this uh, effectively, have absolutely as effective a communication as you can, storytell to those politicians that will not understand the data if you just say numbers or just quote equations. They're not going to get it and they're not going to act. So you've got to give it to them so that how they understand it. And do your best to predict the possible areas where there can be flaws and, of course, to counter that misinformation. Now, one of the things is if you look at funding for these issues, virtually, oh, I'm sorry, virtually all fund, I'm almost done anyway, okay, almost all funding is, uh, is focused on recovery. And that's, and, and not on prevention. And that comes to what I call the JAWS factor. And you, you, should, you should go, what, JAWS? Well, you remember the movie, JAWS? 
okay? Remember what happened when there was this shark out there and it was killing people? What did the politicians want to do? Shh, don't tell anybody, it'll hurt tourism. And that's our biggest problem, is the Jaws factor. The fact that many politicians would much rather be heroes than prevent something because it's hard to sell to the public, oh, I didn't keep this horrible pandemic that would have happened when nothing did happen, right? Because you did the right thing. So these concepts have to be borne in mind, and that's what I, I call it the JAWS concept. And one other thing is, um, I won't read all that to you, but I will say, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, the good thing about science is true whether you believe it or not, but I will tell you this, and do not raise your hand, do you believe in science? Because my answer is no, I do not believe in science. And you know why I don't believe in science? Because science is not a belief. Science is not a belief. Any time that we make the mistake of talking about belief in science, we're not being scientists. We're throwing theology at science, and we must not do that, because then we come at odds with other people's theologies. So we really need to end the constant cycle of panic and neglect, and there are many, many ways to do that. You'll have these uh, slides, so I, I don't need to read the rest of it. Thank you so much for your attention. Sorry if I went over time. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, on one of your last points about communication and telling stories and how politicians want to be heroes, um, do you have any suggestions or experience with how to make prevention heroic? Are there any examples that you can think of where preventative action avoided the big problem that made the headlines? And are there ways we can turn those into heroic stories? Yeah, I think one of the best stories is the, is the work that uh, physicians did in the 1970s, particularly with smoking. Um, that's a big, big story where we were able to convince government and government officials to take action against uh, public smoking. That would be one of the, the big ones right there. Um, it, it is always a challenge, and your question is right on point. How are we going to do this? And that's why I turn to all these young people here, these clever young people that use TikTok and Instagram and all that sort of thing. They, they should be the ones creating these uh, stories that the politicians can hear. Uh, in fact, in some universities, we're now running contests to have students create short explainer videos about these things to get people excited about doing the right thing and telling the right story. Any other questions? Hi, uh, great, great, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, stupid question, I'm not in the field. You talked about type one, two, and three uh, immune, immunology or immune system. Yes. You described what type one and two were. What's three? All oh, right, so, so type three is uh, T helper 17 type cells where it's a, it's, a, it's a neutrophilic response almost right away to things like Canada albicans, right? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, it's another mechanism that the, that the body can go through, one, two, and three. That's it. Hi there. I loved your talk. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question about... I love the way you brought together the evolutionary adaptation angle and the medical consequences that, that come out of that. And, um, and here at, at Illinois, we're working as a group that's trying to put those two concepts together because they're traditionally not funded. Those, the, uni the union of those two, the NIH funds, the treatment and, and infectious disease and NSF and others fund the from the evolutionary part. Do you see any movement on you know, funding silos? And I'm so glad you asked that, that question. That's one of my pet peeves, too. Um, and I think we, ha we, especially in universities and, uh, and also the funding sources, the grant givers, have to restructure how we evaluate each other, right? So, and, and how we evaluate departments. We stylo science by saying, oh, you know, the Department of X 
generated X amount of research dollars, but Department Y didn't, right? And you're in Department Y, <laughs> right? But you need, you need and should be working with Department X as well, right? So if your evaluations include you know, for your success that you did work with the other departments, and that goes as much for the other department individuals as for you, then we would start approaching this from a different angle. And I think that's, that's step one. And number two is the, the grant givers have to also say, and by the way, you get this money if and only if you incorporate these other disciplines. So we have to make that change first to get what you want and what I want accomplished. Thank you for that question. So that was a great talk. There was a lot in it. And I, perhaps I missed this, but you mentioned a couple times how the United States, we, you know, we, did, we did poorly on monkeypox compared to other countries, and we're doing some things wrong. Um, what did, I mean, you've been in the trenches. What are some of the things that you see that we've been doing wrong that, that you think we could improve? It boils down to ideology and social issues. It really, really does. And it boils down to certain uh, people in positions of power that are not necessarily looking at the big picture appropriately. So without naming names, right, there was a certain very prominent politician that chose to downplay COVID, right? And yet, you know, I've been working at outbreak response for decades and training people on how to talk to the media and how to deal with these things. And that was not only wrong on a superficial level, it's also never the way to approach a crisis. The way to approach a crisis is to be honest, but also to have plans and procedures ready so that when a particular outbreak or natural catastrophe is happening, you don't just say, oh no, there it is, because that's not good. But what is good is saying, look folks, this is on the horizon, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's what we, the government, are gonna do about it, here's what you can do to protect yourself, and here's how we're going to balance out the inevitable other consequences, because it's never just the health consequences, it's also all the ramifications from that health consequence and all the economic complications, because you put one person in the hospital, not only does that impact the hospital and that one person, it impacts their family, it impacts the community, and it impacts every aspect of our lives. So, Politicians need to, and we need to figure out how to get them to express what's happening to the population in a positive way. And we're not doing that. Hello, um, I had a question. You mentioned like Omicron when, <clears throat> in 2020, how it spread from humans back to, <clears throat> Excuse yeah, me, back spilled to back mouse. to mice, yeah. Yes, and then it got incubated for like a, about a year, and then it spread back to humans, and then it became like the big, you know, Omicron variant. Do you have any suggestions on what we could have done to prevent that happening, or like decrease the magnitude of the variant afterwards? Yeah, I do, and I love that question. And it, it, it goes down to something else that we've been talking about here, and that's the importance of wildlife surveillance. And that's the importance of taking keeping track of the fact that so many of these things can spill in more than one direction so that we can manage it when it was still in the mouse before it, got, before it spilled back into humans. Thank you for that excellent question. Thank you, thank you all very, very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Eileen. Yeah.